Well, good morning, Kicksters, and welcome back to the Morning Kick for Tuesday. It's a nice and bright and early one, so if you've joined us early, thank you very much. And if you're watching the replay because you needed that extra hour on these winter days, then, yeah, I kind of understand. Well, this morning we're talking about leadership and particularly how to lead during a crisis. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome to the show Justin Lippiot. Justin, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, this is very much a, a message that many people are needing to hear, even though we felt like we were through COVID-19. We're really just dealing with one phase of it. And I'm pleased to have you on the show. Uh, now, where have we actually caught hold of you? You're not in Brisbane by the sea at the moment. No, I am. Um, I'm actually on the Sunshine Coast. I, I work in, and own a business in Gympie. Fantastic. And, and just a, for a bit of context for everybody, I've known Justin for a number of years and seen him working in different leadership positions. And when uh, Justin was posting on LinkedIn, it seemed like a great opportunity to invite him on the morning kick to share some wisdom with you. But let's have a look where Justin's actually been working with a couple of businesses, uh, one in the manufacturing and one in the transport industry. So taking on a CEO role with Pintech. Now, Pintech's involved in manufacturing, Justin. Uh, what kind of products is Pintech responsible for? We're primarily responsible for manufacturing internal door componentry, so um, out of timber. So effectively, we um, make all the, the the components that make up frames and solid door cores, and then we um, wholesale those to the big door manufacturers in Australia. And I can imagine both this business and also you're involved with Polly's Coaches, yeah. uh, both uh, doing a great deal of employment in the local ind industry and, and looking after the people of Gympie and Rainbow Beach. Um, how many buses would you have on the road looking after all of the, the school runs and things? Uh, Polly's currently has 63 buses and we oh. transport over 3,000 students per day, plus other passengers as well, public passengers. That's amazing. Well, you can probably understand why we've been able to get Justin to come on the show and, and have a talk about leadership, because those are two industries, manufacturing and transport, that need a lot of coordination, a lot of staff management. And Justin, I guess this is what COVID-19 has been challenging us about, is how to lead our teams, not only in terms of the business, but you know, where are we actually going as a unit? Tell me, how did you first get involved in leadership? What were some of the first opportunities that you had? Andrew, I guess um, I was always keen to learn from others. So I positioned myself around people that had the wisdom, had the experience, and just wanted to glean from them. And I guess as I sat on the, the coattails of others and got into the wake and the slipstream of others, it was just a natural thing. I just ended up being... Um, in leadership roles because I was with other leaders. In those early years, Justin, did you find it an easy burden to bear? Um, or was it something that you kind of naturally found that you you aspired to and enjoyed? What was what was the feel in those early days? No, I'm, I'm not a natural born leader. <laughs> um, I, do, I think I do have a leadership, um, I do have some leadership in me, but I guess most of my leadership has been developed over time, just as I said, by gleaning from others and, and learning from, from others on how to lead, but also how to follow. Now, talking about leaders, somebody that both of us will have known is Simon Sinek. And a lot of people would be very familiar with his start with why, which has kind of turned the business mm. world upside down. And it's not mm. unusual to find a Simon Sinek video being promoted left, right and centre. But I don't mm. know that many people have heard about his book, Leaders Eat Last. Now, both of us thought this might be a good um, prompt for today's conversation. I'll just very mm. quickly read the back of this book, which says, leaders are the ones who run headfirst into the unknown. They rush towards the danger. They put their own interests aside to protect or pull us into the future. Leaders would sooner sacrifice what is theirs to save what is ours, and they would never sacrifice what is ours to save what is theirs. That's quite a picture of an individual, isn't it? It is indeed. I guess um, there's an, an element of that is um, when you're a leader, you, you take the hit for when the team makes a mistake. Um, when they do something really well, you give them all the credit. Yeah, and I think that this 
personal responsibility is something that some that have leadership thrust upon them struggle with. They think it's a title, they think it's the the lights and the bling, and they lose sight of those core responsibilities, which is taking the mm -hmm. team forward. Let, let's talk about COVID-19. Um, sure. It's really, that has been thrust upon us. Nobody saw it coming. Mm -hmm. How do you think leaders are dealing with this right here and now across many sectors, government, business, entertainment? Do you think we're handling it well? I think it's a very dynamic environment. And I think your mindset and positioning is very, very important. Um, I, I always use two military mottos, I guess. Um, the first one is by the US Marine Corps, which is improvise, adapt, and overcome. And the second is um, by the SAS, which is who dares wins. Yeah. So I guess that's my approach to COVID-19 is um, this is something that, and I wasn't going to use unprecedented, um, that has been thrust upon us. And I guess we've got to be in a position to ride the wave. There is no post-COVID. COVID is here to stay. And I guess we've got to find a way to be able to manage that, uh, manage at the beginning of this um, pandemic, uh, through the pandemic, post, uh, I guess, waves, and then look at the new world and uh, with, I guess, a fresh set of perspectives um, and a new, I guess, mindset and a fresh heart, I guess. It's interesting that one statement that I heard, um, Justin, was that at the end of COVID-19, they're going to be businesses that have their brand forever affected by the way in which they have treated their staff, yeah. some yeah, for the absolutely. better and some for the worse. Absolutely. Why do you think that is? I think it's because at the beginning of COVID, and, I, and I'll speak anecdotally um, from, I guess, from a regional perspective and uh, from my business networks, a lot of businesses at the very, very onset of COVID batten down the hatches. Uh, they went into self-isolation. And, and please, this is not a, um, a criticism or anything. Everybody's got to do what everybody's got to do. But my approach to that was just to wait and see. I, I was only prepared to make the hardcore decisions based on the directives given to me by the Department of Health and the Department of um, um, Transport um, and obviously the federal government as well. So. I didn't want to just react. Uh, a friend of mine uh, many years ago who was an ANSET pilot taught me something that I've never, ever forgotten, and that was um, in crisis, sit on your hands. And and that's what I did was I just, um, at the beginning of COVID, everybody started to sort of panic. Um, and and I, I guess that's, that's fair enough. Uh, toilet paper sales went through the roof, et cetera. Uh, for me, it was just about sitting on my hands. Let me see how this unfolds. But my primary responsibility then was to go back to the staff, go back to my team members and say, look, let's not panic. Uh, let's not overreact. Let's do what we need to do to make sure that we're safe and secure. Our, our, our families and our, and our customers are safe and secure. Uh, but let's, for all intents and purposes, continue business as normal um, with, with, you know, soft distancing and san hand sanitizing, et cetera, et cetera, PPE. Um, but, you know, I guess it's trying to find the, the calm in the eye of the storm. It's a real balance, isn't it? I think that transparency of communication is essential, but not to the point that it seems that the leader is panicking either, uh, that they don't have answers. They're purely spilling information without answers. So how do you get empathy with some form of resolve? Andrew, leaders are the custodians of hope. They, they carry that torch. And so when there is a crisis, when there are dark clouds looming, people are looking to their leadership. They're looking to people around them and saying, well, where's the hope? Who's carrying the, the torch of hope? And I guess that's about the kind of um, encouragement and edification we give to our team members and our staff um, around, look, guys, we know this is a really, really difficult time, but I'm here for you. Uh, to give you an example, um, just going into this sort of self-isolation process at the beginning of COVID, the first thing I did was I went to the Pine Tech um, teams and I said, look, no matter what happens, 
if we have to go into lockdown, I will pay you for the for the first two weeks of lockdown. And almost immediately, um, you know, you could just see the relief, the burden lift from from the team members. So, yes, it would have cost me an absolute fortune. Would have would the business have survived? Who knows? But at the end of the day, um, I had made that decision, and and in doing that, uh, we continue to operate during the COVID period but without the stress and strain of if we have to lock down tomorrow, have I got a job? Am I going to get paid? Uh, Justin, you've hit on one of the things that I think is so evident in life in general, whether it's family, uh, community or business, being able to have that crack of hope. It's amazing how empowering it is when it can draw people towards it. It's like a crack of light in the darkness. Yeah. It basically draws you forward. So I'm really pleased to hear you talk about it. You, you called it the torch of hope. Uh, Justin, when we talk about that resolve factor, there must be a kind of a, a balance in terms of not appearing so cold and steely that, you know, you're like the general at the front that's purely going forward no matter what, and I don't care how many make it to the finish line as long mm -hmm. as I do. Do you, do you kind of balance that somehow so that we go forward? I think we need to be very careful about being adaptable, dynamic, and fluid in our decision making. Um, you know, we are there as leaders to make decisions. That's what we do. Um, we make good, calculated decisions, hopefully wise decisions based on the information we have at hand. And we have to make a decision. That is what our teams look up to us for. Uh, that's what we look to our teams for, even in, in that decision making process. But decisions, whether they are courageous or joyful needs to be made. And I think we are um, entering into a dangerous zone of pride-filled sort of uh, pig-headedness if we are not able to adapt our strategies and our thinking along the lines of a, a very sort of dynamic and chaotic time. Yeah, and I guess we're seeing that at the moment, and, and some tough calls have had to be made. There are global leaders that have had to let a third of their staff go, and there's a lot of heartache in terms of what's actually involved mm. there. But adaptability has to be a part of it. Is it a sense that you throw everything up in the air and let things where, uh, land where they will, or where does your team play a part in deciding what kind of innovation can be brought to the table? I have a highly empowered team. When when I took over these businesses, and it's been my leadership position for many, many years, is to make myself redundant. Uh, many people can't really get their head around that. But I guess my highest task as a business leader is to, to ensure that um, at some stage I have to bow out because I'm, I have such an empowered um, and entrusted team that is able to run the business without me. That, that frees me up within my own strengths and within, within my own sort of entrepreneurial giftings to go and look for other challenges and other things to pursue. So I think it's really a lot about trying to make sure that the teams are empowered uh, and it takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of um, faith, as it were, um, to be able to, to hand over the reins and, and allow the teams to be able to make mistakes. Um, but it's that collaboration that whether you're getting the input from your teams that excuse me that um, basically allows you to make better calculated decisions with your team and with your business in mind because for as business leaders uh, it can get very sorry i want to go back to something justin that you said very early oh. on you remember you were mentioning that when the first part of COVID hit you were willing to sit on your hands and it was the ability to look at the landscape and see what was going on so mm -hmm. a leader must have to have good timing as well because you needed to know when to get off your hands and act. And mm -hmm. it's funny, um, you talked about being an entrepreneur. I think being an entrepreneur is similar to being a comedian. It's all about timing. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I think that it is a lot about timing and it's about making those... Um, Jim Collins talks about it in his book, A Great by Choice, about firing the bullets and then firing the cannonball. Um, so as the leader in uncertain times, we should be firing small bullets all the time to see, you know, we're not taking huge long steps and strides in the future. We're taking small calculated 
uh, incremental steps that will get us to our common goal. So we've covered a number of things about the character of leadership, and mm. uh, I think there's going to be a lot of leaders born out of COVID-19, never yeah. mind made. Uh, tell me about what you see as being some of the principles that leaders should be building into their character, their makeup, maybe their daily routine as a way of being able to lead through crisis. Sure. Um, I think one of the, the key things um, that I learned from um, the World Business Forum a couple of years ago in Sydney, I had the privilege of spending some time with Marcus Buckingham, who had written um, Now Discover Your Strengths, all based, up, based on the Gallup research. And I sat across the table from him and I said to him, you know, what are the key characteristics of a leader? And he just laughed at me. Uh, which sort of was a little bit unsettling because I, I sort of put him up there um, on, a, on a pedestal. But I guess um, the learning that, that came out of it was that, you know, leaders have maybe one or two natural gifts, um, one developed gift. Um, and I guess what we tend to do is we take um, all the key traits of leadership uh, and of leaders and we say our perfect leader has to have 17 traits um, that are going to make the perfect leader. The problem is that those people don't exist. Um, so we need to be mindful of the fact that we need to harness and capitalize on the strengths that people have and then uh, work with them to be able to, to get the very best out of them and to get the very best out of us. So when you think about a leader that is looking from here forward who is willing to say, I haven't handled COVID-19 well, I made mistakes along the way, what can they start doing today that will affect their tomorrow and start to empower their staff? Are there some baby steps you can think of? Absolutely. The first step, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> don't beat yourself up. There is no, <laughs> there's no point in beating yourself up about what has happened. You don't have control on what has happened. You've only got control on what happens today. You don't got no, you've got no control about what happens tomorrow. So I guess... It's about trying to take those incremental steps day by day and make the decisions. You can't not forward plan. You know, we've just obviously a lot of businesses have now completed their budgeting processes for the for the next for the financial year, or they should have been completed some time ago, but they're implementing those budgets now, cash flow forecasts, et cetera, et cetera, planning, scheduling. So I think we have to do those things, but we need to be mindful that that we live in an adaptive and very innovative space. And so when people are doing the, um, you know, battening down the hatches and going into hide mode, those are potentially the opportunities for us to shine and to help our, our, our team members shine as well. Justin, uh, I want to just draw on maybe where you've got your resources from. Um, I was talking to a young man just yesterday about where he was at, and one of the key things that he felt dry, he, he hadn't kind of had any input for a long time. And I think as you're going through the journey of life and business, you've got to keep topping yourself up with great resources. Are there mm -hmm. any that spring to mind that you would point people to or places that they should look where they can get some good foundational top up that will get them going at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of books that I'll reference. Uh, the first one is the one that I mentioned previously, Great by Choice by Jim Collins. Um, right. A second one which I rate very highly and I've read twice, listened to on Audible three times is Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. Um, a third is Blue Ocean Strategy by Kim and Mulborn. Um I'm just trying to think uh, offhand. Uh, I, I guess for me, for, for me, Andrew, is I'm a late bloomer. So I'm currently finishing off a master's in international business. Um, I completed my MBA a couple of years ago and just before that, a, a graduate diploma in management. So I think the, uh, I, it's always good to remember a proverb um, from a wise man who once said, give a wise man instruction and he will yet be wiser. So I think it's about trying to find the sources of information that are relevant to you. I'm never going to be overjoyed about reading ab about the history of nuclear science. Um, so for me to, to, to want to go and just do that for the sake of it is just a waste of time. So I've got to find things that are going to add value to my life and add value to my family, add value to the people around me, and that includes my team members. So 
there are you know a few resources around, but you've got to find something that's relevant and is going to basically strum your passion string. I love what you've shared with us. Uh, Justin Lippia, thank you for coming on The Morning Kick, okay. giving us some insights into how we can be better leaders and just reminding us that uh, it's not over yet. We can start today and keep moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that was uh, very insightful and I think very appropriate. Please share the video, get your friends to have a look, uh, you know, whether you're sharing it up or down amongst your teams, people that you think maybe are looking for some ideas on how they themselves can improve their leadership. There's a lot that came out of this particular episode. Now, when we join you again on Thursday for the morning kick, we're having a look at the charity and nonprofit sector. They've been hit pretty hard by COVID-19 as well. They're having to market themselves to their constituent base. They're having to deal with a lot more need in the community. And we'll be talking about fundraising for charities. If you know anybody that can get some benefit out of that, join us on The Morning Kick on Thursday. We'll see you then.